how does human effort and divine will relate? Because if God has a definite fixed plan, and yet the scripture teaches that prayer has value, we're commanded to do it. What are we changing? Changing God's plan? If you believe God knows the future, as it seems clearly he does, even if that's the mere belief about God that you hold on to, that means the future is fixed once he knows it. Because he can't know a future that's not going to happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Unless you're an open theist, shame on you, by the way, which says God doesn't know the future. That's not the God of the Bible. So how do you deal with a God who commands prayer, wants prayer, indicates prayer, changes things, and yet has a definite plan? The way we try to reconcile this is that God not only purposes the end. of When it says end, that means what will be. The final goal. He purposes the end. This will happen. He also ordains or plans or purposes or wills the means by which the end is accomplished. What this means is there are certain ends and goals, indeed, many that God has willed, planned, purpose, and the way that he has planned, willed, purpose to get there is via prayer. So from our side, because we don't know the end, we don't know it, as we're faithful to prayer. Scripture teaches multiple things, but I'm going to tell you three things to teach about prayer, okay? And right now we're doing summaries of what the Bible tells us about prayer. We have some verses we're going to get to, but everything we're saying is a summarization of scriptural teaching on this topic. Scripture teaches that God's plan is definite and fixed. Already, some people are like, wait, wait, hold on now. Give you a few examples. Do you know in Acts 2 and Acts 4, when the early church prayed, they were, in, in Acts 4, they were getting persecuted. Acts 2 is after a great harvest. They talked about the wicked rulers of, of this age came together and they did whatever your hand had predestined them to do. That's in there. Read through Acts 4. Look at the prayers of the early church. They prayed as if, God was directly responsible and intended the death of Jesus. Why? Because he did. That's not the only example. There's lots of examples like that. People want to make that the one example. But God's plan is definite fix. Read through Ephesians 1. If you don't like what I'm saying, but you believe the Bible, I don't know about that. That feels like that infringes upon my free will. Just read through Ephesians 1. And for extra measure, read Ephesians chapter 2. And you're going to see, this sounds like God had a plan before the foundation of the world and select people for salvation according to his love. Why does it sound like that? Because that's what Ephesians 1 and 2 say. But it's just there? No, it's all over. But you'll see it there very clearly and explicitly. Now, this presents some problems and challenges for how we understand prayer. If you're following, and if you're ahead of me, you're saying, okay, God's plan is definite and fixed, yet we are commanded to pray. Do we all agree on that? We're commanded to pray in Scripture? When we're never commanded to pray to saints or dead people, by the way, only to God. We are taught that prayer has value, aren't we? Doesn't the scripture seem to indicate the prayer means something, that it has value, that to use this phrase, it makes a difference? Doesn't the scripture seem to indicate that? For example, James chapter 5, therefore, it's the last verse on there, verse 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. By the way, if you heard me earlier banging on the prosperity guys, doesn't mean we don't believe in healing. We do, just proper context. We don't need to bring up fake wheelchairs on the side to make you think people are no longer in them. We just see what happens. But what's it say here? The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Very next verse, I mentioned this guy. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Pastor Eric just talked about Elijah last Sunday. Remember that? When my dad read me that story when I was a kid, I, I would say, what is, what is that? What's happening there with Elijah, Dad? He said, son, that means the ravens brought him hamburgers. <laughs> Ever, I still can't get out of my head to this day. Every time I see like a picture or image of Elijah, they're getting fed by the ravens, I think double cheeseburger in the beak, drops it off. Elijah unwraps it and eats it. It's stuck. It's permanently in there. I'm going to ask Elijah, what was it? Was it really a hamburger? Elijah was a man, Nicholas, he prayed earnestly. 
would not rain, and it did not rain on earth for three years and six months that he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. This sounds like prayer has some kind of an impact on things, doesn't it? Well, how does human effort and divine will relate? Because if God has a definite fixed plan, and yet the scripture teaches that prayer has value, we're commanded to do it, what are we changing? We're changing God's plan? Is God switching his plans on the fly? Is he Tom Brady when he sees the defensive line? What's happening there? This is the only time I'm going to quote a systematic theology, theologian here tonight. This is Millard Erickson. This is from his systematic. I like the way he puts this, this little line up here. Hopefully you can read it a little bit. When God wills the end, I'll explain what it means. Hold on. He also wills the means. Thus, prayer does not change what God purposed to do. It is the means by which he accomplishes his end. It is vital then that a prayer be uttered, for without it the desired result will not come to pass. Now, we can like or not like, but whoever you are, if you believe God knows the future, as it seems clearly he does, even if that's the mere belief about God that you hold on to, that means the future is fixed once he knows it, because he can't know a future that's not going to happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Unless you're an open theist, shame on you, by the way, which says God doesn't know the future. That's not the God of the Bible. So how do you deal with a God who commands prayer, wants prayer, indicates prayer, changes things, and yet has a definite plan? So what we try to reconcile is this, is that God not only purposes the end of, when it says end, that means what will be the final goal. He purposes the end. This will happen. He also ordains or plans or purposes or wills the means by which the end is accomplished. What this means is there are certain ends and goals, indeed, many that God has willed, planned, purpose, and the way that he has planned, willed, purpose to get there is via prayer. So we don't see God's final goal, do we? We know some things. He's coming back. That's good news. You don't know all the little details. You didn't know so-and-so would die. You didn't know so-and-so would live. You didn't, you didn't know any of that, did you? And you still don't. A lot more surprises coming, good and bad. But you know some things. God knows, though. That's why the disciples were disappointed when Jesus died. Well, I thought he was the Messiah, but he went and got himself killed. So, you know. They didn't see that in the cards. They didn't understand that was God's plan. And Jesus says, I showed you it was necessary that these things happen. Meaning he's saying that is the mission of the Messiah the first time around. They didn't know that. It was not clear to them. Even when Jesus said, I'm going to die, it still was not clear to them. They thought he was talking about something else. So God has determined the ends and also the way to get there. And that's where our prayers come into play. So from our side, because we don't know the end, we don't know it. As we're faithful in prayer, we will see things change. But I don't think biblically speaking, we could say God's plans change. Things change. And we will also see God interact with the reality in different ways. Now, what do I mean by that? Jonah. What did he do when he went to Nineveh? What message did he preach to them? Do you remember how many days he gave them? Anybody remember? 40 days destroyed. That was all he really said. Have you ever guys read the book of Jonah? Very short on words. He's like, 40 days, get destroyed. <laughs> That's kind of it. You know, when you go ball game, one guy's singing lemonade. The other guy's just like peanuts. That was Jonah. He was just peanuts. Not much else to it. No flowery. Nothing. But what happened in Nineveh? What did they do? And then they got destroyed in 40 days, right? God lied. It said 40 days, you'll get destroyed. He didn't say anything about if you repent, he'll relent, did he? He didn't say that in the prophecy. So God lied, didn't he? They didn't get destroyed. No. God had ordained the means by which their repentance would come about, which was by Jonah's preaching. Their repentance would not have come about without Jonah's preaching, but God willed that that would happen. In fact, God forced Jonah to go. Can we agree on that? He made it happen in every way. 
Do you think the fish was like, I'm going to go swallow a man today and spit him up exactly on the coordinates of Nineveh? God controlled all that. The winds and the waves weren't like, today's a good day for a storm. God controlled all that. Even the lots. Remember the lots? Let's find out whose fault this is. All that. You don't believe in God controlling things? Read the book of Jonah. What's wrong with you? And God controlled everything in that story from A to Z. The plant that grew up at the end to the worm that ate it. All of it. Every single little part. It's not God lying. He's saying this is what will happen if you remain this way. But he also willed that they would not remain that way. So he relented. That was his intention. That's why he sent Jonah there. Sometimes when you have something in your life, God has said this is what's going to happen, and you repent, and sometimes God will relent from that punishment. You're like, oh, thank. Some of you had that happen with court cases, but that doesn't always happen, does it? Some of you had to deal with court cases. They're away from back here. And you're a different person, but they're still talking about what you do. Well, that's how it is, isn't it, sometimes? That's just how it is sometimes. So it's a lot to take in. We cannot fix it all now. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, but at the end of the day, even if all that's over the head, beside, wherever, know this. God commands us to pray. Prayer is for our benefit. It's for his glory. And God uses it to accomplish his plans and goals. And you're part of that in prayer. That's a beautiful thing. There is an element of mystery to prayer. We must recognize that as we put all these things together. Sometimes people will give this objection somewhat similar. They'll say, well, if God knows all, why pray? It's an erroneous objection. Let's talk about why briefly. Because isn't that, it's not a horrible question. God knows everything, right? Then why are you telling about your toenail and he already knows, right? Why does he want you to pray? Prayer is not just telling God stuff. And it's definitely not telling God new information that he does not know. When you pray, he's not like, Oh, they had a heart attack? <gasps> they broke up? Oh, my gosh. And I had this other idea. He, does, he That's not what's happening, right? He knows, and yet he wants you to tell him. When you communicate about these things to God, you are sharing your innermost thoughts to the Lord in speech. And you know what? God enjoys that. You know what? That blesses God. That's, that's the biblical message. That's what you see. Because it's true he knows it, but he wants to hear us say it. And this is a little bit relatable. You love me? You know I love you. Why don't you ever say it? You, you know it's true. I want to hear you say it. So are you saying you need my help? I mean, you know, I want to hear you say it. Are you saying that you're sorry? Well, I mean, I get I want to hear you say it. There's an element of that. This is a relationship. God's not your homie. He's not just the guy down the street, but it is a relationship. God wants to hear you say it. What do you tell your kids when they, mm, mm, what, three words, what do you say? Mm, you say, use, use your words. Guess what God is telling you? Use your words. That's what prayer is. So if you're like, why do I got use your words? And I'm going to say something, and I'm just trying to be cool, clever, but I think this is really true. I think if more of us told this dirty, deep, deep stuff about ourselves and other people that we've got to take to God in prayer, if we did that better, all of us, I think we would gossip a lot less. You wouldn't have, I got to tell somebody this real quick, just so well, you wouldn't have to do that as much, or maybe not at all. And you wouldn't be as interested in hearing it if you were in that kind of communica communication with God. Think about that. It's got to go somewhere. God knows. Pray. Tell him. Speak. It'll be good. Reiterating, God does not change his mind. Things change and God acts in accordance to his plan and his holy nature. So from our side, it could almost look like that. But the Hebrew word nakam that you sometimes see in context where God is interacting with his creatures different, sometimes translated as repent. The word isn't, repent's an English word, nikam's a Hebrew word. They're trying to get at the sense of what it means there, but it's what's called anthropomorphic. 
I know that's big, but it's trying to picture God in terms like us so we understand what he's doing. For example, God is angry, the psalmist will say. His nostrils flare up. You guys ever read those texts? His right hand is strong and powerful. God is invisible. He doesn't have nostrils and a right hand. We're not talking about Jesus incarnated, especially in Old Testament context. We're talking about an invisible spirit God. It's relating it so we understand. He doesn't literally actually have a footstool. He doesn't have a foot to put the footstool on. Because once you're physical, you're limited, and he's not that. But anthropomorphic is describing it in a way we can understand. So if you read the KJV and it says God repented, you understand that's saying God interacted differently, but it was always part of his plan. He's not like, man, I'm sorry. One time, Janice, I was at a River of Life camp, and they had a guest teacher, and he came in there. He said, you know God repents. He's sometimes sorry for the mistakes he made. And I said, Lord, oh, he do not. I won't say who it is, but I remember that. Things change, but even the things that change is per God's will. And because God is sovereign, that means in charge, he orders all things according to his purpose. Next slide, something to think about. Prayer is more than one thing. Hopefully we've already got that. And when I say that, what I'm saying is this. If you ask some of these questions, usually it's because we have a one-dimensional view of prayer. First video games were, well, I guess it's 2D, right? And then they now they get into 3D games, right? And now I guess, I don't know, is when you have the stuff, and all, is that 4D? I don't know. But the point is, you have more dimensions now that you can see about these worlds that are created. Prayer is more than one dimension. It is not simply supplication. Let's tell Sylvester to say that. Simply supplication. What is supplication? Anybody know? Fancy word. What's it mean? It's when you're asking God to supply you with something. It's Supplication is a fancy word that means requests. So if somebody's like, dear God, please do this, and God, give me that, and God, they're, supp they're supplicating a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of supplication, that prayer. Maybe a little too much supplication. Prayer is supplication, right? But it's not just. Prayer is not just intercession. Now, it is intercession. Dear Lord, we pray for so-and-so, for this situation. But it, it's not just that. Do you see how it's multidimensional? Prayer is not merely a soliloquy a speech to God, but it might be in there. It's definitely not therapeutic self-analysis, although God will show you your faults. It's definitely not religious ritual, although it takes place in public as well as private. It's not just a special recitation, although there are times to recite scripture specifically. And prayer is definitely not a magical formula. Although Christians pray in Jesus' name, not because it doesn't work if you don't, because Jesus said, ask these things in my name. You wonder why Christians say, Jesus, because Jesus said in my name. Now, what is he really saying, though? What he's saying is authorized by me. It's not the special name of J-E-S-U-S, -S, which, of course, is the English translation. Anyway, it's the idea of it's authorized by him. The prayer is under his authority. That's why we can have the gall to pray to God, because Jesus. That's why we're saying that. We're saying, you know, the old cop show, stop. In the name of the law. What are they saying? They're saying by the authority of the law, right? So that's what in the name of Jesus is. The idea is under his authority. Prayer is multidimensional, though. There's a prayer of praise. There's a prayer of adoration. God, you are so beautiful. Look at this mountain. You made this. You're even better than the mountain. Prayer of thanksgiving. You gave us this. Thank you. Prayer of confession. Lord, I messed up, and I need to tell you about it. I've been ignoring it. Confession is admitting guilt and repenting before the Lord. You see that in example of 1 John 1, 9. All these are parts of prayer. 